Anna, thanks for joining me. If you wouldn't mind starting with your name, your title, and just responsibilities. I'm Anna Russell, GM of Brand Marketing at Audi of America. And my responsibilities cover all of brand marketing from media to um, creative concepting to social media research um, and beyond. So you won an Effie for Stay Uncompromised. Congratulations. What was the inspiration behind that campaign? Which is kind of twofold. Um, firstly, it was really coupling the vision of the designers and bringing the A3 to America. They really kind of went overboard in making sure that they brought this completely uncompromised um, entry level sedan. They didn't compromise on luxury or design or performance. You know, in fact, actually, the technology was the, the first in the A segment to bring MMI. And actually, it was the first car in America to have 4G LTE. So they had this vision of really kind of bringing a breakthrough product to that segment. And then we coupled that with an insight about the target audience as well, who were, we knew um, were millennials. They had very high expectations. And in true Audi fashion, we tend to kind of attract a really kind of progressive audience that like to kind of challenge the status quo. So we really wanted to marry the vision from the designers and bringing a really uncompromised product with the target audience who obviously wanted to be uncompromised and really kind of sought things that, that um, really delivered on that. I'm sure there's hundreds of decisions that go on in the production and the lead up to a campaign. Were there any pivotal decisions that you think back on? You say that was an important one. I mean, yeah, there's, I mean, there's always two great points. One is when you really feel that you get the strategic direction and, you know, you can feel the kind of energy behind the team. You know, when we kind of landed on Stay on Compromise, it just felt so right. You know, we'd done these product clinics and it really seemed to fulfill on what consumers were actually saying about the product. And just also the way that they kind of, our consumers saw themselves as well. They really saw themselves as challengers. They really saw themselves as kind of pushing the status quo. They really saw themselves as kind of doing things differently. So it felt like this really great sweet spot in Stay Uncompromised. And then of course, just selection of creative. There's always, you know, many ways you can go. And, you know, there's always that moment of which is the one, you know, so when we selected the Jews script, which was, you know, to the lyrics of We Are the Champions by Queen, I think that was a great moment as well. I think we all got really excited about mm -hmm. that and really felt just how emotional it was and just how it delivered on our strategy. Any leaps of faith that you needed to make to, to get to the end? I think there are always leaps of faith. <laughs> I mean, you can do your research. We obviously did product clinics. You know, we did we investigated the psychographics of our target audience a lot. But of course, you know, we always like to kind of do breakthrough work, and we always like to be at the leading edge. And when you're at the leading edge, there's always leaps of faith involved. I mean, look at the social program that we did around it, where you know we invited people to share their stories, and then we actually turned their stories and their tweets into lasting pieces of art. And not only did we do that and collect together 15 different artists from all sorts of different fields, whether it was comics or rappers or improv comedy artists, but we all filmed it live over six hours as well, which was kind of a, an audacious <laughs> task. And, you know, and honestly, nobody had ever done it before. So when you're breaking ground, breaking new ground with, it, or with things that have never been done before, there is an element of faith. I mean, the beauty was, you know, it took off and we had just incredible success with it, which is great. But yeah, of course, it was a leap of faith. So Ricky Gervais was one of the people profiled. Um, any concerns? He's a pretty polarizing character. Well, I mean, the whole spirit of the campaign was about people who were fearless. Mm -hmm. You know, our designers were fearless in what they wanted to achieve with the car. And everyone that we featured in that spot was fearless in some way whether it was Lindsay Adario and her photojournalism in Darfur, to Ricky Gervais, who's turned down really huge parts because he's really uncompromised in the types of parts he, he wants to do. And he's polarizing because he speaks his mind. And that's something that, you know, we really appreciated. He has integrity. And that's something that we kind of really live by at Audi. Everything's got to have substance. Everything's got to have integrity. And, you know, Ricky Gervais definitely delivered on that. So what, what was the primary goal behind the campaign? Was it to um, take market share from your competitors, uh, upsell an existing car buy from somewhere else? Um, what was that goal? Well, our research showed that the A segment was going to be a huge growth opportunity here in America. Um, 
So we felt it was a great opportunity to bring in actually first time luxury buyers. Really, you know, our, our goal was to bring in 70% conquest new to the category. So a lot of it was actually about growing the whole category and making sure that we brought in those first time buyers. Of course, it's always wonderful to, to get market share from competitors, but we knew to get to kind of our ambitious sales goals. Honestly, we'd need to conquest from the mainstream and bring them into the luxury sector. So was there a fear at all of cannibalizing existing sales? Um, when you launched the, the, you know, or relaunched, I guess, in some cases, the A3 into the US? Yeah, so I mean, it was a complete relaunch in that the the whole vehicle was redesigned from, you know, from the ground up. So it was an entire new launch. Of course, you know, it's something that we watched. Um, but I think what was really interesting is, one, that we brought in completely new buyers um, to the segment. And actually what we saw was the A4 actually did really well on the back of the A4. Um, on the back of the A3 advertising. So what we found was a lot of people came in for the A3, but a lot of people also upgraded mm. to the A4 because they wanted a bit more space. So actually we found that the two sat really well together and we found that actually the A4, because of all of the noise in the marketplace and how many new consumers we were bringing into the brand actually benefited from it. But of course it was a concern, but um, we were very fortunate in just seeing the dynamic play out that actually we just brought more people into Audi altogether. So how did you come up with the key customer insight? Was there a specific way in which you did that? I mean, we started with the product. We did a series of different product clinics just to see how, you know, the A3 stacked up against its competitive set. And, you know, one of the things that we kept on hearing from consumers was the fact that, wow, the attention to detail, the performance, and just the incredible amount of tech, they couldn't believe that we were bringing this in an entry level vehicle that every bit was through and through and they were like, wow, you haven't compromised anything. So this word of compromise kept on coming up, whether that was how the designers talked about how they put the car together to even how consumers talked about the product. And one of the things that we know about Audis, people see this great affinity between them and the Audi brand, you know, in terms of, you know, there's this kind of sense of humor, a slight sense of irreverence, but actually underpinned by kind of great performance. So, you know, when people were using the wording of uncompromised, you know, they also kind of were reflecting their own approach to life as well. So we felt there was this really great sweet spot there. So talking to customers, were there any other, any other ways in which you were doing research or really trying to understand what motivations were? Yeah, I mean, we, we undertake a series of different studies whether that's syndicated studies or kind of custom research. So for this was such a big product launch, obviously we did quite a series of um, consumer insight work to really understand the psychographics and the mindset of the audience and to, to make sure that we really genuinely kind of connected with something that was meaningful for them so that we could kind of bring, obviously, and market the product in, in the most appealing way. Because at the end of the day, we're, our goal was to drive demand and make sure that people came into the dealerships and kind of wanted to make sure obviously that the A3 was seen as hot. And, you know, I always say our products are so amazing. We just want to make sure that we can get people so that when, once they drive, drive an Audi, they never look back. You know, our goal is to drive enough people into the dealership so they can actually experience the, you know, the amazing nature of our cars. So honing in on the customer language seemed to be one of the most important pieces and even maybe even made it into the campaign around staying compromised. Uh, this notion, despite all of the data and psychographics that you had. I'm just wondering, do you, did, you, did you think about that as you were developing the campaign? I'm just curious. I mean, it was something that really came through when we looked at the product, you know, the consumer clinics and the fact that they, that was how they were kind of describing the car. And that was almost the thing that was kind of the biggest moment of surprise that you could get this entry level that was uncompromised. And even the way they talked about, you know, the people that they respected in business you know, this whole movement from a CEO just being in a suit to, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or Jack Dorsey or, you know, Blake from Tom's, you know, there was this whole kind of movement of kind of millennial leaders kind of really kind of shaking things up and being very uncompromising about the way they did business and being very, very true to their vision. And that was definitely something that came through when we were talking to consumers, you know, and asking them about, the, the role models they see in their lives. So they felt like there was this really good match between who they wanted to be, who they aspired to be, and also what they were looking for in, in the product that we were bringing. 
So why don't I pick up on one other thing you said earlier in the conversation around um, getting this idea and then taking it to market in all the various aspects of the campaign. How did you make those decisions? Um, you know, TV versus how you're going to promote the campaign, um, you know, potentially digital. I'm just wondering how the, what was behind those decisions. How, how did you plan the campaign, if you will? Well, we work with our partners, you know, Mediacom obviously do all of our media planning and Venable Bell and Partners is our lead creative agency. So really we kind of gather together and clearly look at all of the data, which is what is the best possible way to meet our consumer in the most relevant way. So, you know, and that's multiple touch points. You know, as we know, people are watching TV on dual screens. So making sure that we had really smart digital programs that complemented what we were buying on television. Clearly, social is huge for this demographic. Um, and we really wanted to, to tap into the fact that this demographic loves to create, loves to share their stories, you know. So putting them front and center and really making them the heroes of the stories and bringing their stories to life. So really, we really kind of were helping them kind of capital, capitalize on those, those memories and kind of um, drive it forward that way. So you had a team behind you, I'm sure. Um, how did the team play a role in the success of the campaign? Oh, I mean, the team is everything. <laughs> you know, it's like I always think advertising is, or marketing is the ultimate team sport. It takes so many people, you know, and as I was saying earlier, you always know that, you know, when you get that, the core idea and you can see it sparking different ideas, you can see how energized people do and how they can bring it to life in their field, whether it's digital or social or PR or content, you know, all of the team kind of took it and really kind of made the campaign their own because, you know, one size doesn't fit all. You know, what we did on Twitter doesn't necessarily work on Instagram, doesn't necessarily work here. So, you know, it was great just to see the team really kind of galvanized behind it. I mean, even our dealers, I mean, every single one of our dealers held a launch night, you know, uncompromised event. That was 279 simultaneous launch night events, which was pretty incredible, honestly, to pull off. So. Yeah, I mean, it was without doubt a massive team play. It's quite the coordination, quite yes. the coordination. So um, winning an Effie is about marketing effectiveness. How would you define what marketing effectiveness is? Well, yeah, there's the measurable <laughs> stuff and then there's the anecdotal right. stuff. So, I mean, at Audi, we, we measure it against awareness, opinion and consideration, obviously sales. You know, we obviously also track where our conquests are coming from, you know, what audiences we're bringing into the brand and we set parameters of what we want to achieve and obviously measure ourselves against those. But then there's also the kind of unspoken or the anecdotal, which is, did the organization galvanize behind it? Did the dealer network get excited? Because at the end of the day, the dealers are everything. They're the ones who kind of have the relationship with the consumer. They're the ones who sell the product. And it's really important for us to make sure that we have a campaign that our dealers are really enthused about. So that's another kind of, I guess, silent KPI. Um, and just also how the industry reacts as well. It's something else and consumer comments and social, of course. So switching gears a little bit, talking about yourself, um, you've reached a level of success in your career. Um, what fuels you? Oh, I mean, I love a great idea. <laughs> you know, I, I love a great, you know, when you have that breakthrough moment where you think there's a, just a great cultural insight where you can sit and go, wow, this work is going to have cut through, it's prov provocative, it's progressive. You really feel that it's kind of a little bit kind of defining of its times. I mean, that's just a great moment. And then obviously the beauty of marketing is, you know, you work hard, you get a strategy and then, you know, you see the fruits of your labor because you see it going out into the world and then you can see how consumers respond to it. And obviously at the end of the day, we really want to move consumers. You know, you want to have an emotion, you want your work to have an emotional connection with them that actually kind of is meaningful and kind of at the end of the day drives them to action. So you must follow some brands or you know, at least acknowledge them in the marketplace. Are there any that you follow or track you think are interesting or you just love? I'm just curious. I mean, I think it's just a really interesting time, you know, at the moment there's just so, there's such a proliferation of kind of interesting companies who are really kind of challenging how things have been done, whether that's Tom's with their one for one model or Airbnb, I think it's incredible what they've done with their business model and, and also even just some of their marketing tactics, you know, with the house floating down the Thames, you know, really disruptive, really imaginative, you know, with a, with a sense of fun. So I really like what they've been doing. 
Burberry is pretty impressive, honestly, in what they've done with the digital space and really kind of bringing almost the Burberry feeling that you get in store and that tactility to online. So I think that's been really impressive. And then, of course, there's work you're jealous of. <laughs> I mean, the, the uh, I mean, I have to say I love the Run Like a Girl campaign by Leo Burnett, which I think was just absolutely kind of breakthrough and really kind of resonated. So, yeah, you always see work. You think, wow, that's good. It seems that you have a, um, an interest around this intersection between um, the idea, um, the practical notion of it, and then it somehow moving either the group that it's targeted forward. I don't know if, if I'm putting words in your mouth, but I wonder if you could talk, talk about that. No, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think it's the, the difference between talking about what a product is and why you're doing it, you know, and obviously why is, has a much more of a kind of deep-rooted emotional thing. You know, how do we really try to have work that's progressive, provocative, that has a point of view? and a bit of a reflection on, on culture, because that's very much kind of a core part of our DNA. So we definitely gravitate to work in that direction rather than just explaining a set of features. We really want to talk about what those features mean to someone. Okay. Well, let's talk about marketing. What do you think is the biggest opportunity today for marketers? Well, I mean, the tech explosion, I mean, <laughs> it's is, you know, from artificial intelligence to augmented to reality to the proliferation of apps. Data is obviously a huge one because we're collecting data, you know, in an unprecedented scale, you know, really being able to kind of micro target people. So, I mean, I think that's really exciting, but it also poses a huge challenge. One is obviously fragmentation because how can you be at all these different places with a kind of yet yeah, the singular soul of a message, but yet yeah, you actually have to adapt it to each different touch point because people are in a different mindset at each touch point. So that's quite a challenge for marketers. So you have this great opportunity offered by data and all of these new platforms. The other side is how do you cope with the fragmentation and how do you fuel them with the content that they, that they need? So I think it's a, it's a really interesting balance. Any tips or suggestions you would have to marketers to help maintain that balance? Uh, authenticity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think if there's one thing that I'm most proud of, I think, in our, in our social approach is the fact that we really try to be authentic in each of the channels. You know, we definitely have moved away from matching luggage and pushing a message. You know, what we do on Snapchat is very different from Instagram. That's really quite different from what we do on Twitter. Um, it takes a lot more work. And as I was saying, it takes a lot more heavy lifting in terms of just content creation to make sure that you genuinely have an authentic voice and you're adding some value. You know, you're not just being there to create noise, but you actually, you know, you want to actually kind of either entertain or inform or actually give consumers something that they didn't have. What would you predict for the future? Um, I think search is going to be really interesting because, um, you know, obviously search was built on searching for information, I think it's going to definitely evolve in searching direct to action. I mean, you look at everything from Uber and all of these different apps, which you know are kind of feeding you the information that you need. So I think um, search is kind of going to evolve a lot into kind of really almost predicting behavior a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did a spoof thing for um, April Fools with an autonomous chair that could actually sync to your, your computer and actually could read where you were meant to be at what point and take you directly to the meeting. It's like, though it was fantastical, you're like, well, it's maybe not so far. There probably is a time that actually knowing all this data about you, that things will sync with your calendar, will know that you're going to go to that meeting, which means you need an Uber, um, you've made this lunch appointment and, you know, open table will be able to track that and feed you up, you know, restaurant, um, recommendations and stuff. So I think that's a really kind of interesting sphere of, I think, apps and search will change. And um, the one thing that holds true is storytelling. You know, people still love a great story. People still love an emotional connection um, with the brand. And, you know, with over the last 10 years, I mean, just the, the power of people has grown, you know, whether that's through social media and you look at things like Kickstarter, just the, the ability of, you know, people to galvanize and connect with one another has grown. 
And that presents a great opportunity for, for people because they obviously need the word of mouth thing. It also presents a challenge for, for brands as well, which is why it's so important to be authentic. Mm. So if you're not, that might not play out so well. Well, thank you very much. It was nice right. meeting you. Thank you.